Good evening. Welcome to Reflections on East Granby. Tonight's episode is our 17th episode. Tonight's guest is, my name is Mike Malloy, and I'll be your host this evening. Today's date is February 13th, 2010. Our guest tonight is Mr. Donald Holtman, attorney Donald Holtman, from East Granby, uh, a resident of East Granby for quite a long time, and it's a pleasure to have you here tonight, Don. Mike, pleasure. Well, let's get started. Okay. Okay. Uh, you, uh, you were born in 1936. Yes. You are 73. I will be uh, 74 in three weeks. 74, almost okay. 74 years old. Uh, where were you born now? Glens Falls, New York, southeast okay. corner of the Adirondacks, if you know that territory. There's a lot of towns in there. <laughs> that whole, it's a <laughs> yeah. big area. Yeah. Well, this is 10 miles south of Lake George, if you know where that is. Pretty area. Yeah. 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 Beautiful yeah. area. Yeah. Uh, what are your what are you, how many how, how until what age did you did you live in Glens Falls? Uh, and I, we moved to Connecticut. My family moved to Connecticut when I was short of five years old, about four and a half. Okay. We used to go back up there for vacation until I was in my teens, so I, I know the territory fairly well. But we moved to Connecticut when I was about four and a half. Uh, what were your parents' names? Uh, well, my father's name was George. He was a, a, a manager of Kresge's stores. Remember S.S. Kresge's, the five and dime, five and dime chain. So the name sounds familiar, but it well, was a they became bit... ultimately became Kmart. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. I know that one. <laughs> yeah. But it was S.S. Kresge's, and S.S. Kresge's had, they were like Woolworths. They had a chain of five and dime stores all over the country. Okay. And they would move their managers. It was like being in the military. Four, really? Four, five, six yeah. years, they'd move their managers. And my father was moved from a New York store to Glens Falls, New York, where I was born, and then ultimately to Bristol, Connecticut, where we moved, and that's where I grew up. Great. What's your? Do you have any memories of, of uh, Glens Falls as a? As yeah, a they're uh, childhood memories. So they're sort of like tableau. You know, you, I don't remember yeah. what happened before the thing, and I don't remember what happened after the thing, but I have this recollection of a thing. More of a picture. Yeah, exactly. It's like <laughs> what's your shot. first? What's your first memory? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I have one. We, uh, my my father was a devout Lutheran, and the nearest Lutheran church was in Saratoga, which was twenty some odd miles away. And on Sundays, I don't know whether we went every Sunday or not. I was a kid, but but we used to drive to. Saratoga to church, right? And on and and on the way there and on the way back, we would go by some place between Saratoga and Glens Falls that had a cage with a black bear in it. And I remember oh, no. that as a child. I mean, I still s remember seeing that black bear pacing in that cage, right by the side of the road. Was yeah, it like, it was, yeah. in front of some kind of store or something. You know, okay. I was, they like the Northwoods uh, sort of yeah. mystique up there. So, right. Yeah. Right. Wow. Okay. So uh, when you were growing up. Uh, in New York, you said, wait, you're five years old when you moved to Connecticut? Four and a half. Four and a half. Yeah, okay. right, I was short of five. So yeah. you're fairly young. Where, did, where, where to, did you move in Connecticut? Bristol. Bristol. That's where I grew up. And you, uh, how many years were you, did you spend there? You went to school there? Yeah, I went to uh, grade school and high school, and uh, then I went off to college, but I came back to Bristol even after I completed law school. Right. What was Bristol like then? Well, Bristol was uh, what it is now, essentially smaller. Uh, yeah. It's now grown, I think, to about sixty or seventy thousand people. It was about thirty thousand people at the time. Good sized town. Uh, yeah, yeah. For Connecticut at that yeah. time, uh, essentially blue collar. A lot right. of factory. I mean, uh, Connecticut was a big manufacturing state at one time. Sure was. <laughs> Remember, yeah. that's all. Seems Trying to, to hang up. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and that was Bristol. Okay, so you uh, you attended school through uh, primary school, uh, secondary Great school, school, high school, yeah. okay, and then uh, went off to college from there. And where did you go to college? Valparaiso University. Ever hear of it? Uh, say that again. Valparaiso University, Indiana. No. no. Valparaiso University is in northwestern Indiana. It's in the Chicago uh, metropolitan area, so to speak. Right. And I went there to college and law school. So you, the same school. Yes. Oh, okay. So it was a, a university. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So you got your degree there. And, Two degrees. Uh, I got a bachelor's degree there, and then a, a bachelor of laws degree. I graduated from law school there. Okay. When, and what year was that, approximately? Uh, 1958 was my law degree. Okay. From there, what did you do? Uh, I came back to Connecticut, uh, passed the bar, started practicing in Bristol. We still had a draft at the time, right. and I got drafted. Uh, okay. I'd been practicing for, let's see, I was admitted to the bar in August of 1958, and I was drafted. I have to stop to think, sometime in the summer or fall. I practiced for about a year and then was, was drafted. Let me just ask you a quick question. Before you, went, before you were drafted, you were, you were a practicing attorney. What type of law did you do then? Uh, general practice. I, I first got an association with a lawyer who had a very general practice, and, right. and to his credit, uh, he would give me a file and say, do it. And he okay. was there if I needed help, but it was, 
Good way to yes, learn. Sir. Yeah, good way to learn. It was like being thrown off the end of the dock. But he was there with a the life preserver if I needed it. Yeah, right. So right. I, you know, I fairly varied, and uh, um, uh, at some point, I don't recall now when it was. It's been so long ago that that uh, my original <coughs> contractual time with him expired, and I asked for a raise, and he didn't want to give me a raise, so I went out on my own for a few months. Before you got drafted. Yeah. Let me ask you a quick question about practicing law in that era. What would you say has changed the most since that time? Oh, I, I think the law has changed a great deal. Yeah, and, yeah. And the practice of law has changed a great deal. Uh, back in those days, there were a lot of uh, solo practitioners and okay. very small firms. Uh, there was uh, almost every lawyer, especially in cities like Bristol. Now, maybe in Hartford or New York or the bigger cities, you had lawyers specializing. but. But it was rare to find a lawyer who limited his practice to a certain area in those days. And nowadays, of course, we have mega firms, yeah. uh, and and the smaller firms tend to be boutique firms. That is, they tend to specialize in right. certain very narrow areas of the law because you can't you can't know it all. So, so it's followed the trend of specialization that's existed, say, say in medicine. Same, it was uh, a lot yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. much more group practice uh, and uh, much more. Uh, either you know, smaller firms that do very limited areas of, of law or very large firms that, that cover mm. the gamut. Uh, okay, so you get drafted, and where do you go? I was sent to Fort Benning, Georgia. Fort Benning? Yep. That's I, a pretty I, big base, huh? Yeah, and you have very, I mean, I remember um, getting off the plane. We flew, well, at first we went through Fort Dix. We were in process through right. Fort Dix for a few Didn't everybody <laughs> seem like yeah, I think. I, well everybody from Northeast yeah yeah that was a processing center yeah and then for basic training I got sent to Fort Benning Georgia and what I recall most vividly about that is is getting off the plane uh, that we flew down on from Fort Dix and seeing a chain gang now yeah, huh. I, uh, the cartoons used to show prisoners in black and yeah, white stripes, stripes chained and together. there they were working on the road. And I thought, really? my God, this is the United States of America. It was right, so right. primitive. It was a different world. Yeah, it was a very different world. <coughs> that it was, was a, before real serious civil rights. Uh, well, uh, there was some, but not. Uh, very yeah. little. And it, as a matter of fact, it was my first encounter with, uh, with blatant racism. Really? Yeah. Uh, it, well, in basic training, uh, you know, you, you tend to form little groups of friends very quickly. Yeah. And we had a group of friends. And, and one of the guys in the group was a fellow from New York who happened to be an African-American, yeah. uh, Perry Middleton. I still remember Perry. And we went through basic training together. And about halfway through, we had been on base for four weeks. Right. And about halfway through, we got a pass to go uh, in town. Right. And everybody was very excited about that. So we all sat around polishing our boots and getting yeah. ready to go in town for the first time. And Perry was sitting over in the corner doing nothing. He said, come on, Perry, where do you going? He said, I can't go to Columbus, Georgia with white guys. Yeah. It struck me. I mean, I was, I was terrified. I was horrified. Yeah, and appalled. Yeah. Different world. Was, yeah. He knew he couldn't do it. I didn't know he couldn't do it. I never thought about it. I think most people really don't uh, consider the fact that that sort of uh, segregation was so recent in our history. It seems like... Very recent. Very recent. I, and unfortunately, I think it's still around us. I mean, yeah. I, I think there are still people who are profoundly motivated by uh, racial animus. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. discount that, yeah. It's too bad. Uh, fortunately, it's not institutionalized anymore. No, yeah. no, and I, 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 you know, Connecticut, I think, is better than Georgia in that respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And North Carolina. I mean, so I, it was a little bit of a culture shock being down there. And, and <coughs> yeah, you, it was. You were, yeah. uh, you went in as a, in the JAG Corps, you said? Well, I went in as a, PF says a private, private, okay. a private first class, as a private through basic training. And ended up from Fort. So Bragg. everybody had to do that, no matter. Yeah. What, yeah well, everybody that. was drafted as an enlisted man. I was an okay. enlisted man. Okay. So then they. And yeah, and then they uh, was sent from there to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Right. Had some encounters with peculiar racism there too, but. Yeah. But uh, uh, I was assigned as a legal clerk in the office of the Judge Advocate General. Right. And the colonel, who was the the core Judge Advocate General, came over to me one day and said, "Have you ever thought of applying for a commission?" I had, and, and they, they said, we don't have any room for you, so, right. I, so I told them I had applied, and they, they told me there was no space in the class coming up, so uh, he said, well, if you still want to apply, I'll get you a commission, and that's when I found out it's not what you know, but who you know. And yeah. So I got a commission in the JAG Corps, right. went from there to the JAG School, which was in, then in Charlottesville, Virginia, I think still is, at the University of Virginia. And from there, I was assigned to First Army Headquarters in New York City. Right. Uh, First Army headquarters then occupied Governor's Island, which subsequently became a uh, 
uh, Coast Guard headquarters, okay. and then now I think is uh, they're debating whether it should be a national park or a yeah. city park or whatever. It's it's, a, it's not uh, utilized. It's not used yeah. anymore. A great great <coughs> spot for a young bachelor, right in the heart of New York City. Yeah, yeah. New York was quite the side. place. So. And then from there, I went to Heidelberg, Germany, and then I got out of the service. Okay, so you're uh, at some point you met your wife. Where where I met her in Heidelberg, Germany. I met her like the third day I was in Germany. I had a feeling there was a connection there based <laughs> yeah. on the name. Well, my wife is German born. And your name? Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, when I when she answered the phone today, I kind of <laughs> got, got a little, slight accent. A little bit of an accent. Yeah. 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 What's her name? Well, her, her, you want her real name or the I name? I love her real name. Well, her real name is Eva <laughs> Farina Elisabeth. Okay. But, but everybody calls her Ina, E-N-A. Ina, yeah. 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 So she was, uh, what, where, where in Germany was she from? Well, she, her family originally came from Saxony, uh, which uh, was, became part of the East Zone. Uh, okay. In fact, she, she, uh, her family came from the city of Chemnitz, which for many years was Karl Markstadt, when the oh. Germans took it's now Chemnitz again. Uh, she was actually born in the Baltic Sea in a place called Stralsund, but her family fled west when you could still do that before the wall came up. So they got west of the wall. They got west of the wall, and they ended up in northern Bavaria in a little town called Bad Windsheim. Okay. Uh, but she uh, uh, went to the University of Heidelberg. She's a medical technologist, and she okay. got a job with the U.S. Army Hospital in Heidelberg. Heidelberg was a major U.S. Army headquarters at the time. Right. And uh, I met her through some mutual friends. Uh, she was working for the U.S. Army Hospital, and I met her there. Great. So you married her there? Did you guys... Uh... No, married there. As a matter of fact, my son was born there. Wow. So yeah. you started a family in Germany. Yep. Wow. yep. So uh, you were, you were um, enlisted, you said, what, five years? You were actually... Uh, I drafted in... Let's see, I got... I was drafted in the 59, and I got out of the service in 65. Four and a half, five years, yeah. Okay. So not quite five years. So, uh, I think I was drafted in the fall of 59, got out in the spring of 65. What was Germany like then? Oh, I liked Germany was great back yeah. in those days because the dollar to the mark was very strong. I mean, it was, <laughs> there, was, there were monetary controls at the time. Now, you know, we currencies float, so right. every day you can read what the dollar is worth <coughs> versus the euro sure. or whatever. But in those days, it was pegged. There were, there was, uh, a mark was equal to a quarter. Okay. And we had the best of all possible worlds because there were things in the German economy that were much less expensive than they were in the American economy. And there were things in the American economy that were much less expensive than they were in the German economy, but we could buy them at the U.S. Army Commissariat, Commissary or the PX. Right. Uh, you know, things like coffee, which was very expensive in Germany. Right. We could buy it very cheaply. Cigarettes, everybody smoked in those days, the cigarettes. Right. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> it's like a buck a carton or something. Right, it's right, right. <laughs> Gasoline was almost uh, nickels and dimes. So, yeah. so on a lieutenant's pay, by then I was, I think by then I was a captain, but somewhere along the line I became a captain. You could live like pretty king, luxuriously, yeah. <laughs> you know, quite luxuriously. Yeah. Different now, I'll tell you, it's different now. Yeah, yeah. Military pay went a long way. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so you spent, uh, you came back from there. Where did you go? Did you get the uh, while I was While I was in the service, <laughs> stationed in, uh, in New York City. Yep. Uh, I had, I was, uh, uh, in, as a matter of fact, I was the chief of the claims department there at f the, f the JAG section. And there was a lawyer working with me at the time who was from Connecticut. And we decided that when, when he got out of service and I got out of the service, we would open up a practice. And he was from Simsbury. Okay. So we opened up a practice in Simsbury. That was in 1965. Wow. That's a few years ago. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, you had, uh, so you came back and you started, what was his name? Lou Kiefer. He's still Luke practicing law. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you, Lou and you started your little law practice in yeah. Simsbury yeah. and yeah. obviously were fairly successful. Well, <laughs> we, we made a living. We're still you know. doing it. <laughs> still doing it. Yeah. We made a living. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, you settled in Simsbury for a while? Yes. Yeah. Lived in Simsbury uh, and lived there. I had a, we bought a house in Simsbury. It was a little ranch house. As a matter of fact, the down payment was my wife's the equivalent of Social Security. When she left Germany, right. Germany gave her back her contribution to Social Security. Really? <laughs> was, I, my recollection is it was something like $2,000. Okay. On hey. 65, 1965, that was a lot of money. And That's... it was a down payment on a house. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't buy a garage for what we bought that house for. It was like $16,000. Right, right. Four or five room ranch with a... So that would have been the equivalent of maybe thirty or 40000 bucks today if you I consider guess. it as a down payment on a house. I, I yeah. guess. Wow. <laughs> And, so they handed her a check. And, and then uh, while we were living in Simsbury, my daughter was born, and we began realizing that that house was a little too small. It was, we had a small bathroom and two bedrooms. And 
So we began looking, and we, we both like the this kind of the standard four up, four down colonial, a two and a half bath, right. kind of a cookie cutter house. Kind of like house two houses in one. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you, know, yeah. you have lots of bedrooms. You have yeah. a guest bedroom, you have a bedroom for each kid, you have a bedroom right. for yourself, you have a living room, dining room, family room, kitchen, uh, two and a half baths, so you don't have to wait in line to get into the bathroom. And we began looking. We wanted to stay in Simsbury and discovered that houses in Simsbury were far too expensive. Really? Well, we're running $35,000. <laughs> I mean, Even 000. on an attorney's yeah. salary back there. It was yeah. a lot of money. So we had had our house on the market, and we had our real estate broker looking for some, yeah. some place in Simsbury and finally decided that we just simply couldn't afford it. We'd seen a couple of houses that we liked. Now, what year? This was the late 60s? 68. 68, okay. Yeah, it was, yeah early 68. So you practiced and lived in Simsbury for a few yep. years. Yeah, okay. and... Uh, um, so I told the real estate broker, I, we, my wife and I agreed, that we told the real estate broker we simply couldn't afford it, so we're going to you know, take our house off the market and stop bothering to look. He said, well, it's really too bad you want to stay in Simsbury because I have that exact house you're looking for in East Granby, and it was $28,000. Right. Well, well, go see it. Right. That's where we live. Well, <laughs> it's not that house because it was a new development at the time, but it, we saw the model and, and uh, had the house built. And you live on Sage Lane. Sage Lane. We were in there in August of 1968. One of the original homesteaders. And stuff. Yeah. I mean, that development, uh, that we had several choices of lots in there at that time. Yeah. The thing wasn't built out. Now, now you, you, did your, your daughter had been born at this point? Yes. Or was on, yeah. Yeah, she was born in, uh, I have to stop thinking. <laughs> Son was born in 64. Daughter was born in... 68. Okay, so you, uh, what, are your kid, what are your children's names? Well, my son is named Peter. Peter, right. Uh, okay. He lives in Westport, Massachusetts. <laughs> right. Uh, just, just beyond the Rhode Island line. Uh, he has a couple of kids, Emily, my granddaughter, who is a junior in, at University of Rhode Island, and my grandson, who's going to be 16, not tomorrow, but this week, wow. next week. Uh, my daughter lives in Windsor Locks. In, uh, she, she lived in Windsor Locks. She lives in uh, yes, she lives in Windsor Locks. Now. I was going to say she lives in East Windsor, but she moved from there to Windsor Locks. Okay, and she's yeah. unmarried. But okay, works for the state. And so you you uh, so they stayed fairly close. He's still yeah. Yeah, can, yeah. We see our daughter frequently because she's very close. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, our son less frequently because he's a hundred miles away. But you know, every four or six weeks. And right. Thank God, there's telephones. So, what 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 what, your, what what was your first experience with East Grammy? When the first time you came here, what was your impression of the town? Was it you must have driven through when you lived in Simsbury, going to the airport or whatever? So you yeah. had some conception. I, I, yeah. I, I, East Grammy is a lovely town. It was, yeah. it was, it was exurban, uh, a lot of rural areas. A lot of the areas that are now built up were not. Right. So it was uh, attractive. Yeah. Uh, I remember the old town hall. The town hall had burned down. Right. And what was left was the vault. Right. <laughs> and this little tiny vault where the where the town clerk, whose name was Effie Miller, I remember her. I, I have a recollection that she must have been two or three hundred years old at the right, time. Right, <laughs> this right. Very elderly lady who was the town clerk forever. Yep. In this tiny little vault, but we liked the. Wait town. a minute. Shoot, wait, wait, explain this vault. What, what was what was going well, on? Wait, it was literally the vault of the old town hall. You so know, that's it, all that was left. The, the town hall had burned down, and there like was nothing left vault. but the but the yeah. Where they kept the land records. So, did she have electricity in there? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. I don't know if she had a toilet. <laughs> was it a big steel door <laughs> no, no. she would lock when she left? It, I just remember this tiny little little, little land record yeah. thing. That was the, <laughs> that was the interesting. Whole yeah, there's got to be some pictures of that somewhere. <laughs> I, I'm sure. Uh, see Tom Howard. He would okay. have pictures of those. Actually. All right. So we got so. Uh, you're you're in in East Granby and you're you're continue your law practice in Simsbury. Did oh, yeah. you move? Yeah, your, no, yep. I stayed in Simsbury until uh, 1970, and then I moved to uh, joined a firm that was in Farmington, and from there went to West Hartford, and from West Hartford to Hartford, where I've been really since. What, what's your what, what's what did you specialize in in those days? You see, you, you saw, obviously evolved yeah. from uh, GP. Uh, well, when I when I practiced in Simsbury, uh, yeah. we really did everything. Uh, okay. And, uh, Real estate, especially residential real estate, those were the boom years of residential real estate. Lots of closing. Was a substantial part of our practice. But I did name it. I did criminal work. I did family work. I did civil litigation. I we did. Uh, I even did tax returns. Now I can't even do my own tax return. <laughs> right. I, I get. I have a tax lawyer. Does you my threw a little return. accounting yeah. in on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Just did. Uh, you know. You name it. We did it. Really? And then over the years, it slowly narrowed down to the point where I was doing essentially litigation. Okay. Uh, both criminal and civil. And then in about... So for us, those of us who aren't attorneys, what is li define litigation? Uh, it's lawsuits. It's being okay. in court, okay. basically. Trial right. practice. Right. It's a trial practice. And I did both criminal cases and civil cases. And along about, I'm going to say, 
1978, but don't hold me to the date, I decided I was going to give up criminal practice. Okay. Because I just simply couldn't keep up with the mushering. I, I didn't feel like I was serving the clients right. as fully as I'd like to because I wasn't able to keep up with the, the developments. So I began focusing on civil litigation, uh, lawsuits, A versus B, Joe versus Mary, whatever. Sounds like it, civil was, seems like it would be a little more uh, predictable kind of... Uh, a cycle to it as opposed to well I don't know no, I, no I it's, it's, so it's, it's, it's probably less predictable oh is it really okay all right. well because it's a very I mean it's personal injury it's okay. construction it's okay. uh, it's uh, you know commercial it's a lot all more money on the line sometimes uh, sometimes yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and and then somewhere along the line I began representing a town and a and by the way I always included family I always did divorce work and that yeah. kind of stuff it, along with civil and still do and in 19, gosh, years go by. I want to say 1978. Somehow or other, I became counsel to the town of Litchfield. Okay. And I discovered this keen interest in municipal law. And I was counsel to the town of Litchfield for 10 years till 1988, and enjoyed every minute of it. That's kind of a leap. You must have. Did you know somebody up there? That's a. Well, uh, I I got the appointment through a, a fellow who had Litchfield connections. Okay. And he recommended me, and I interviewed, and they hired me. Okay. So they right. retained me, and I stayed on until there was a political change. It, unfortunately, or fortunately, as the case may be, town council jobs tend to be subject to political wins. Whims. Yeah. yeah. And then so uh, a new election came in, and then the new first selectman announced that she would prefer to have somebody else in that job. And I understand that. That's perfectly all right. Yeah. And uh, then I got uh, a Again, really through somebody who had been had some contact with Hebron, I became town attorney for Hebron in uh -huh. I think 1988, and I have been town attorney for Hebron since 1988. Along it's about kind of far flung from Litchfield. That's yeah, it. yeah, on the other side of the river. And yeah. In 19, I want to say 1990, I became town council to Granby, which I still am. Okay. And uh, along about 1992 or so, I became council to town of East Granby, which okay. I still am. And then managed to pick up some other quasi-municipal or municipal entities, not full towns. I represent the Suffield Water Pollution Control Authority, for example. Yeah. I do tax collections for the town of Heartland. Interesting. I'm, I'm not their <laughs> town attorney, but I, yeah. I, I tax collector refers me. And yeah. I've done work for the Chatham Health District, which is a regional health dis district like the Farmington Valley Health District. Chatham? Chatham Health District. And it's Marlboro, Hebron. Oh, okay. Uh, Adam, uh, when I think of Chatham, I think of Cape Cod. No, I, <laughs> that's a different. I, yeah, I, they, yeah, I different too, Chatham. They, they picked the name because I think one of the towns in the district originally was called Chatham. But oh, okay, all right. So uh, you've obviously made quite a career out of that, and you continue. Yeah. You have so now I, I would say probably the bulk of my practice is municipal stuff. Right. So you've been <clears throat> you've been involved quite extensively with uh, the development of quite a few towns and seen seen some changes come about. What, in, in, in the case of East Grammy, what, what do you say would be the biggest change in, in East Grammy since you came here? Or since you first formed an opinion? Uh, you don't mean necessarily in, in the area of law. I, I oh, not in law. No, no, no. Well, you know, we, we have certainly digress. moved from a, an exurban or rural town to much more of a suburban town. Right. Uh, it's development, residential development all over. Um, there is, uh, you know, when I came to town, he did have a full-time first selectman at the time, but but only recently. I mean, right. It had been a part-time job. Okay. Uh, and now it's a very demanding full-time job. Sure is, yeah, First yeah. selectman works 60, 70 hours a week at least, I would think. Yeah. Uh, so that's new. Uh, and, and life has become a great deal more complex. Right. When in... in uh Pluses and minuses. I mean, if you were to say what what is what are the best changes, and this is kind of a loaded question, so feel free to punt it if you don't. But what what, <laughs> what is the what what would be the the best change, and what would be the the thing you least like seeing changed? Or well, as I say, I mean, the, the major change has been uh, the growth of residential development in town. Right. Uh, much much more. Uh, and, and much more expensive houses than, than used to have. Yeah, uh, it's a trend everywhere. Yeah, it's a trend to make mansions everywhere. Uh, uh, East Granby could still use, I think, a more commercial development downtown. It's a consistent uh, theme for people. Yeah, I mean, and I know, I know our, our town leaders for years have been trying to do that. Mm. 
uh, but to a large extent that's market driven and not yeah, you can plan for it, but it ain't going to happen unless there's somebody who wants to invest in it. To a certain extent, you can build it, and they will come. In other words, you lay the template yeah. down. Yes, and you, that's the best you can do. Yeah, and that's, you hope that yeah, the exactly right. economy exactly carries right. it from there. Exactly right. But is there anything that you wish hadn't changed? No, other than no. Well, I, I think comfortable living in Granby has been in East Granby has been a delight. I mean, yeah. I, we've enjoyed it and uh, feel very much at home here. I mean. We're long-time residents. We moved in here in 1968, so that's 42 years ago. Yeah, you have a unique perspective. What would you say? What, from just thinking back to your we're representing municipalities, or whatever, what was the most interesting case at a town? Is there anything that pops up that you that you tell other attorneys about when you're? <laughs> I can't believe this one. <laughs> well, you know, you always you always there's always get, something. Huh? You always get some odd cases. And, and I, I think lawyers practicing law find them much more interesting than laymen do. So that's true. You know, they say, what a great case this was. And you'd say, what a dull thing that yeah. was. I mean, you know. Yeah, I mean, we don't want you to start very quoting statues. Issues. I know when I, in, in representing <laughs> Hebron, uh, uh, they expanded their sewer system, and, and the municipalities have the right, and as a matter of fact, the duty to assess benefits. That is to say, if you have sewers available to your home, right. that improves the value of your home. Right. And the cost of that sewer system can be laid off to people who, at least in part, it, it laid off on the homeowners of the properties that are benefited. Right. It's called assessment of benefits. And the, and the issue in this case was whether you could assess benefits against a regional school district. Right. It uh, never got resolved. It was on its way to the Supreme Court and settled. But it was, I thought, a fascinating issue. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. So you, you uh, in your, yeah, I'm sure there's uh, countless cases that were kind of, uh, from a legal standpoint, each case in some ways carries yeah. its own yeah. kind of yeah. interesting kind of. Uh, okay, so, you, so your children went to school in East Granby? Yes, no, both are in East Granby. What was your experience with that? Was that a good? Fine, thing? Yeah. fine. I, they, they, you know. <laughs> They did. They did well. Obviously, they did well. <laughs> they, you they stayed graduated. Here. They're not in jail. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't had to represent. They're honorable, <laughs> so, as far as I know. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, if you were to, it, some, I was. This is an interesting question. If you, is there any character that jumps out from your time in East Grammy? Somebody, some resident that you'd like to share, uh, without getting into anybody's legal <laughs> problems. Right well, now. I'm no, just kidding. I mean, no, but is there any interesting characters that? Uh, uh, that may get lost in the in the sands of time that you you remember that. Uh, oh, there's so many, really. And yeah, for for many years, as you know, our first selectman was filled by Frank Rothheimer. Frank, I thought was was quite a character, a very able politician, and I mean that in a positive way. Right. Uh, he was a very good manager, um, and and he had a knack that that I think is is a marvelous knack. As a matter of fact, the first selectman of Litchfield, when I was appointed town council out there, had that same knack, and that was the knack of knowing everybody in town and something about them. Okay, like, right, right. Mike, how's your business? How's your yeah, kids? Yeah, how's yeah, your wife? Yeah. I mean, and it, it, I, I was I was astounded at that capacity that, yeah, uh, yeah. that he had. So, just kind of uh, keeping the ball rolling. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I, I, I think it comes naturally to some people. It is. They I agree. remember names. They they know about people, and they're really interested in people. And yeah. know, as a consequence, it shows. So yeah. That's yeah. what makes them successful politicians. It is. Again, with a, a non-pejorative, I don't mean that in a pejorative way. Yeah, politicians is not necessarily a bad word. <laughs> I think it's a good word. No, I, well, you know, there, there's this very common conception today yeah. around this world that, that politicians are somehow either dummies or crooks or bureaucrats or whatever, and I think that's absolutely wrong view. My experience with public servants is that for the most part, they are dedicated to their work, dedicated. Oh, yeah. They may be wrong-headed, right, right. Uh, but, but they're really dedicated to their work, and, yeah. and they, they do this thankless kind of stuff for minimal dollars, yeah. uh, relatively speaking. Uh, and and they deserve a lot of credit and, and praise for it, not criticism. I, I feel I yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I think that they they tend to be very driven people for the most yeah. part, and 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 regardless of like you said, wrong headed or whatever, uh, or whether you agree with them completely, they uh, they tend to uh, get they 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 honestly believe that what they're doing for the most part is for the best. Yeah, and they're hard. Yeah. You know, I, I think about the towns I represent, and, the, and, and every one of those towns, almost, I will say without exception, every one of the, the people that I have encountered in these various offices, as mm. selectmen, as town managers, as, as uh, tax collectors, as assessors, or whatever, are hardworking, honest people putting in long hours at relatively little pay with very little thanks. 
Right. right. <laughs> so nobody comes up and says, gee, thanks, you did a great job. Until you retire. And, 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 <laughs> and I kind of resent it when I hear people criticizing them, frankly. I mean, yeah. I think that's ignorant. I, yeah, uh, excuse me. My, my, I, I would agree with you. I, I think that, unfortunately, on both sides of the equation, I think that oftentimes when you have that criticism, it's part of a debate, and sometimes people might take it as criticism. But secondly, I think it does jump over into uh, a level that is has nothing to do with uh, with the person. It, it has to do with the the debate that's going on. Oh, well, I, I've never been uh, offended by. Strong. Policy debates. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I think yeah. those are. That's the great American tradition. I agree, though. The character assassination, that sort of thing, is. Yeah. No when, when you start talking that, about people being yeah. lazy and and yeah. uh, you know milking the public trough and yeah. that kind of stuff, and you're looking at hardworking people who are doing an honest day's work. Yeah. Of, you know what I try to find? I, I use as a template. If you can't find something, no matter how heated the debate gets, if you can't find something good to say about the person you're debating with, you should probably take a few steps back. Yeah. Because they're, they're, yeah. don't say anything about the person. It's right. not the person, it's the idea. Right, it's, right. It's but you're losing your perspective yeah. if you yeah. start to yeah. impersonalize it. Yeah. Anyway, so we we, uh, we get you to the point where you're in East Granby and you're, you're, you're your reflections a little bit on the on the changes in town. What what if you were to change something going forward? What would you other than well, you kind of touched on that. You think that we should have some sort of a, or you'd <coughs> like to see an improvement in the commercial base? Yeah, the, it would be nice, I think, for East Granby ultimately to have some commercial center retail uh, center. retail yeah. essentially that yeah. kind of business thing. Uh, whether it ever will or not is again, I think, a function of market. Right. Um, I have been intrigued over the last few years by this concept of smart growth, and, and maybe East Granby should be predestined to be uh, yeah. residential and, and have the malls and the stores elsewhere. And yeah. that's, uh, uh, I don't know what the answers to those questions are. I, I, I do know that regionalism is, is a thing that's coming. It's going to be very difficult to produce in Connecticut right. because of this historic, we're one of 169 very independent tough. towns. Oh, yeah, yeah. But in point of fact, uh, uh, it, the independence of the towns is, is, I think, doomed ultimately economically. Right. Uh, I think people in this area have to recognize that they are part of a metropolitan region. Right. The heart of which is Hartford. You're part of it. You got to share in it. You got to contribute to it. Uh, I know that that's not a popular notion, but I think that that's the way we're going. I can see both sides of what you just said because I look at towns that are even like the size of Enfield, where I, where I grew up, that there's, there's factions there that are di very difficult to bring together. Oh, yeah. And at the same time, you get towns that, uh, like East Granby and Heartland and Granby, that can work together on certain things. You know? Yes, and do. But, but you, and you do. were in town when they tried to develop to, to have a, uh, a three-town high school. They went at it. Two-town. I think it was two towns. Suffield, Suffield. Initial, well, this is my understanding. It was Granby, Suffield, and East Granby at one point. There was a vote on that, and that went down. And then Granby backed out, and it was going to be East Granby and Suffield. But whatever the, the configuration. My the, recollection is that Suffield backed out okay, uh, of that right. deal, and it was partly because they thought of themselves as a little bit higher class than East Granby. Which, right. But they, <laughs> so they had their, but, but that's what I mean. Yeah. I mean, those are the yeah. types of idiosyncrasies yeah. you have to overcome, yeah. and even on a very practical level where it would have been good for both towns. Yeah. Uh, you have, but I think you're starting to, you start, you, like the financial needs will drive that. If people understand yes. that they're going to save hundreds of thousands of dollars by forming cooperatives and, and somebody translates that into a mill rate for them. Yeah, unfortunately, know, it's, it's not being systematized. It, it's, it's coincidental. The sharing right. of building inspectors, for example, the sharing of, of dog pound I mean, on a very small level, but right. you know, East Granby doesn't have a dog pound. Well, if you have a dog that's got to be impounded, where do we do that? We do that because we have an agreement, I think, with Suffield. I'm not sure. Uh, and so you, you have these intertown agreements that are growing and growing, but they're not specifically systematic. Right, right. Some they're, of them are cross border. Right? They're ad hoc as, as necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, if, you were, if somebody was to ask you something about East Granby, something unique, something that, uh, if you, somebody was just came to town and, and they said, what's the most unique thing? What would you suggest they see? Anything jump out? Oh, well, yeah, well, I mean, obviously, Newgate Prison is, right, right, right. is yeah. Uh, yeah. huge historic value. <laughs> that's, that's, a, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a, well, well worth the trip. Uh, and, and on top of that, uh, if you like hiking, the Metacomet Trail it's it's through beautiful. East Granby is a beautiful trail. Yeah. So it's very worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think those are, it's 
principle, you need certainly geographic or historical features. Yeah, I always I, I try to ask. I haven't asked. I always think to ask that question, but I haven't. But it's it's funny the things you don't re recollect daily about your own hometown. You know, it's yeah. a lot of beautiful mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, if you were if you were giving uh, uh, if you had a wish other than retail, is there anything that you would wish for East Grammy? If you had a wand and you could say, okay, tomorrow, bang. Other than having a nice little you know, mystic style village center with nice little shops <laughs> and, a, and a pharmacy downtown. But well, other than that, is there anything? No, I can't think of anything. I mean, I think East Granby is a lovely little residential town. It's you know, what, I think one of the things that, uh, that I noticed, uh, somebody like you, for example, if you were involved in the process and you understand why things happen, you accept it. And it kind of, that's one of the reasons it's so important for people to be involved. Because when they're engaged and they understand the, the pluses and minuses to each decision, it makes sense. Oh, yeah. I mean, you understand why certain things are there. If you don't understand it, it's really easy to have a resentment about a certain decision. But if you really understand, like you said, most of the people you've worked with are very involved and dedicated yeah. and, yeah. and uh, hardworking, honest. They, they, they give fair dollar for their service. I mean, they're, they deserve a lot of credit. So that's why Don's such a nice, happy guy, because he's very happy with the town. He really has nothing <laughs> yeah, I, to complain about. I, 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 have, I, have, I have no great complaints about the town at all. No. It's, you know, it's a, I say, well, wouldn't it be nice to have some, some retail stores? Wouldn't it be nice to have a grocery store? We yeah. had Cane's Market here for a while, and they didn't last very long as a market it was convenient to have. Um, could our school system, of course, my kids are long out of school, so I'm a little bit out of touch with the school system yeah, in the yeah. sense that, that I'm not aware of, I mean, you're a parent, are you, are you satisfied with the quality of education? When my kids were in school, I was always a little concerned, and I think I would still be concerned about the, the relative smallness of the school system, right. which prevents it from having the kind of range of courses. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, I don't know what they're teaching in foreign languages now. When my kids were in school, I think it was Spanish and French, if that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, some towns teach Russian, Chinese, Italian, whatever. So I, I think the benefit we have today, and, and is, is there's so much extracurricular stuff for kids today. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, like... There's eight different sports you can play, yeah. and if you're willing to travel a little bit, there's there's a lot more in the way of regional kind of schooling. You can go to the University of Hartford, and and the Hart School has extremely uh, advanced music classes for it, for kids from for children. Yeah, for, I think that's well, great. Yeah, I mean, some yeah, of it you'd pay for, but you know. But I remember my son blowing a clarinet, couldn't stand it. I mean, it was. Oh, like, right, right, right. What's, what's, <laughs> would rather have him, have him go to Hart and blow it there. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But seriously, I mean, if you're and, and parents are much more in that track today, but I think the basic education they get in East Grammy is pretty phenomenal for the size yeah. of the school. Uh, yeah, I, I never had the sense that my kids were were uh, undereducated. I do recall. Uh, shortly after we moved to town, I mean, it wasn't many years after we were here, there was some sort of, uh, and I think the Board of Education did it, a survey of uh, home, uh, reading habits at home. Right. And then the results were circularized. And I was frankly appalled at how few people had books in their house. Really? A telephone yeah. book and the family Bible, and that was it. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, in our house, we always had books. and Yeah, and, yeah. And so I, part of it. We've made a point of reading to my son since he was born. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and yeah. now he's a very fluent reader in yeah. first grade. Yeah. So, but yeah, those are the types of things that that's more of a more of a uh, a cultural thing, yeah. and you really can't. Although they have, they built a beautiful library, it's yes, quite a Absolutely. place. Absolutely, I mean, but, well, this whole center has developed. Uh, yeah, you know, in a relatively short period of time, when um, we didn't have the, the, the community town, center. we didn't have the community center, we didn't have the town hall, we didn't have the. The post office where it is, I mean, all of that has been developed. And the library, it's in the town garage, it, you know, it's yeah. it made a nice town center. Yeah, so, so for somebody focused on that, you can see the improvements, dramatic yeah. improvements. Yeah. yeah, the senior housing a couple of people have brought up. Yes, yeah. excellent. That yeah. allows people to stick around. So oh, uh, if there was anything uh, that, uh, this is a question that I always try to ask because you've, you've been around a few years, very successful, you've raised a family. If you were to give advice to, to a child today, what would that be? To a child, to a to a young person. I mean, children. I have a six year old. They generally don't listen. They kind of probably fifteen. <laughs> yeah, so you give them advice, it's going to ignore it anyhow. Right, you just keep repeating. So why waste the time? <laughs> right, but well, just just know. life I mean, advice. Uh, Is there anything uh, that you want to share? Yeah, well, I think kids ought to expose themselves to a, a lot of reading, music, art, culture, travel, uh, even if it's uh, travel through the television channel. That is, right. uh, 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 life is uh, offers an awful lot, and it's. Right. I think it's an unfortunate thing for people to grow up thinking that that uh, 
Roast beef and potatoes is the only thing you can ever eat. And there are other right. things in the world. There are other people in the world. There are other customs. And and uh, uh, so, you know, I think kids ought to enrich their lives. And I think pa parents ought to do what they can to enrich their children's lives by just exposing them to a variety of, of life. Right, right. Uh, different people, different cultures, different flavors, different music, different art, different whatever. Yeah, I think I, I, th that experience you just described gives you the confidence to go out and, and enjoy your life and do the things that you feel yeah. that you feel. Or, or, or find life miserable, but at least enriched. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, some of the great works of art are, are not designed for entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> the people who did them weren't that happy either. <laughs> All right, so that's, that's great. Is there anything else you'd like to share tonight? I mean, is there anything uh, that you're... Uh, that you've thought that of your 40 some odd years in East Grammy that you're... Yeah, I wish I had thought of it, like the, the final message that I could leave. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> no, I, if, I you, if we'd given you this ahead of time, it wouldn't <laughs> be any fun, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, no, I don't think I have any particular advice other than the advice that I would give to kids, I think I would give to adults. The same. Yeah. yeah, I would say, don't, don't put blinders on. Don't put blinders on. Right. There's too much life out there, too much variety, there's too much richness and you know support UConn women basketball and <laughs> and don't be too disappointed with the men <laughs> so, right, right what right. else can you tell people yeah they lost today you know well we certainly appreciate coming on tonight Don it's been I, a pleasure well, and it honor. has been a pleasure and, for uh, me. and uh, to our audience tonight I'd like to thank you for joining us uh, we continue to bring you as many stories as we can from our lovely town of East Granby and Don is yet another remarkable case of that uh, you can view this uh, every Friday night, our show, Reflection, Reflections on East Granby, at 8 p.m. on GCTV Channel 16. You can also view it on the website, which is gctv16.org, uh, and you view up, pull up the View Online prompt. And I'll throw in a little plug here. If you, want to, uh, if, 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 if you want a copy of any of these shows, you can buy a copy for $20 from the station, all of which goes to help support uh, everything we do here. It's a nonprofit organization, and they're on a shoestring. So anything you can do to help would be appreciated. And once again, I'd like to thank Don Holtman for coming in tonight. My, and, my uh, pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.